Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me for this virtual science conference presentation. My name is Jordan Kester. Uh, I graduated Freedom in 2014. I then attended the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. Um, I was there for six years, uh, and I just actually got a job as a PGY1 resident at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. I actually just got my doctorate of pharmacy uh, this April. So exciting stuff is happening, even though we're all separated. My presentation is going to be the development of new drugs and vaccines, uh, the future of COVID-19 treatment and prevention. So some of the goals that I have for this presentation is to discuss current data on COVID-19 and really why this pandemic is occurring, I review the investigational, preclinical, clinical, regulatory review and approval of vaccines and medications, um, identify false claims and treatment options that are being spread around, and look at exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. So this COVID-19 pandemic is affecting the United States um, very, very rapidly. So you can see um, there's over a million cases now in the U.S., and uh, 60,000 of those people who have contracted it have died. Um, and that's compared to yesterday, uh, in just one day of updates, there's 26,512 new cases and uh, 2,500 new deaths. So things are happening very quickly. In the graph at the bottom, you can see exactly the progression of the U.S. Uh, cases and how they emerge. And you can see exactly when um, the testing became more widespread. You can see a large diagnostic jump in, in the cases. So what is exactly COVID-19? It's a virus, so it's not a bacteria or a fungus. It originated from animals and then spread to humans through consumption. You primarily get flu-like symptoms, so runny nose, cough, things like that. But some of the dangerous symptoms are shortness of breath and a fever. So why this pandemic sucks? So it's novel. Uh, there's no herd immunity built up, uh, whether that be natural or artificial. Uh, just like the flu, most people have had the flu or are vaccinated. So that would be um, natural immunity and artificial immunity. Uh, so everyone basically is prone to get infected by it. Uh, it's also a virus, so antibiotics and antifungals don't really treat it, and the current antivirals available to us are very specialized to the types of viruses that they treat. Um, also, many infected show little to no symptoms, uh, even though they're still contagious. This is unlike the SARS epidemic not too long ago, in which uh, patients were only contagious when they had uh, symptoms. Now people can have the disease and carry the disease without really, really showing symptoms. Uh, there's also, there was also a late response to contain the virus. Uh, there's been cover-ups from China. Uh, I know there was a physician in China who um, had tried to kind of blow the whistle, but the media and the government tried to kind of silence him, and he ended up actually passing away from COVID-19. And the data published from China really didn't show how dangerous it was until it was too late. So the WHO, um, the World Health Organization, didn't get a jump on it, therefore the CDC didn't get a jump on it, and it kind of just trickled down the line all over the world. Everybody was late. And uh, the real killer is uh, the main symptom of shortness of breath. This affects the elderly, uh, people with COPD and asthma, and the immunocompromised. Uh, so older people normally have a uh, tougher time breathing as it is, just because as things get older, things work, tend to work a little bit poorer. Also, People with COPD, so uh, people in the, who in the past have smoked are at higher risk of having damage to their lungs. And uh, with asthma, it's, it's very similar, but it's just more of a pre-existing condition. Immunocompromised, you can be immunocompromised by medications given to you and like transplant or rheumatoid arthritis, or uh, you could also have diseases that immunocompromise you. So it just makes your immune system a little less effective. So now onto the process of discovering treatment options for both vaccines and medications. They follow a very similar uh, track. So the first is the investigation or exploratory stage. And this is the attempt to find an antigen. This also is the heaviest uh, research portion in uh, the entire uh, track record of developing a new vaccine or drug. Uh, these uh, studies are federally funded um, and governmental scientists across many different labs tend to work on trying to find this antigen. Uh, this can often last between two and four years. An antigen is really any part of the pathogen that a body can react to. So it could be weakened viruses or bacteria, um, weakened bacterial toxins, or substances derived from pathogens. And these can even be um, live inoculated pathogens like in MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. These are live inoculated uh, vaccines. 
they can be pulled, uh, the pieces can be pulled from the pathogen or they can be artificially created and mimicked in the lab. And this is done by um, a lot of computers and programs that can run simulations to see exactly what antigens can be targeted uh, within the immune system and with what we have available uh, in the lab. So the preclinical phase, so this is after we have an antigen that can be targeted, uh, we develop something that can kind of uh, start that immune process into the body. So at this point, this is before human testing and we're just testing the immunological response in an animal model. Most animals selected are mice and monkeys, but it can vary. And this is testing their cellular response to a vaccine. If we're testing a drug, uh, we will infect the animal with the, uh, the disease and then give the drug to see how they respond. You have to find uh, some efficacy and safety information based on this. So is it working in animals? And also you actually have to find out um, what your kind of basic starting dose is. You don't really get a perfect number, but it can kind of give you a rough ballpark to start slow and go, er, start low and go slow. You have to find an LD50, which is uh, the lethal dose to kill 50% of the population. This is often done in mice. Uh, you might think it's cruel, but in order to find the safety um, information, it's imperative that you really know uh, when this drug becomes toxic, especially before the FDA will allow you to test in humans. Uh, vaccines, it could be possible that they can find a minimum effective dose of when the animal starts to uh, become immune and, and provide that immune response. And these results can't be directly extrapolated from animal models, but you can get a good starting point. Then you have to apply for an investigational new drug, and this is through the FDA, so you have to submit all of your uh, investigational and preclinical data to the FDA, and they can say, okay, we're granting you uh, the right to, hum to test in humans, or hey, you have to figure out some more information about the safety, uh, or uh, it might not be as efficacious as the FDA would want it, so maybe you have to go in and, and really try to see if your drug will work. Then you move on to your first human trial. And this is establishing safety and dose, which is really kind of the same thing. Uh, you have a small number of healthy volunteers. Um, in the vaccine case, it's going to be all your volunteers are going to start off as healthy without the disease. But in drugs, uh, you're just trying to find uh, the safety and the side effect profile. So you'll test people without the disease. And this is 20 to 100 people. It occurs over a few months. You see what side effects are present and what the highest dose tolerated is before you start to see those side effects. And about 70% of medications move on to phase two. For phase two, you're trying to establish the efficacy of the drug or vaccine. Um, so this will include volunteers uh, with the disease. Uh, in vaccines, again, you're starting out with uh, people without the disease and just observing them for longer periods of time to see if they get the disease. And this is with uh, about 100 to 500 participants. And it can last between a few months to a couple of years. Uh, and it's basically to see if it actually works in humans. And only 33% of medications move on to the next phase. In phase three, you're trying to establish efficacy and safety in a large population. So this is basically, uh, in our small models, you're kind of extrapolating out to bigger models and to seeing if they actually work in uh, kind of a, a better sample size of the people in the United States in whatever country you're trying to get this drug approved in. And this uh, includes 300 to 3,000 participants with the condition, um, or within vaccines case, it's people who you're just going to monitor to see if they get the condition and it can occur between one and four years, and only 25% of, uh, of, meta, of medications move on to the public, and that's medications uh, only. Vaccines tend to have a lot more data thrown at them in more phase three trials. I wanted to bring up the scientific method. Um, so the traditional scientific method is you have a hypothesis and you test that hypothesis with scientific study. Uh, this is really more of you have a problem and you want to propose a medication or a vaccine to fix that problem. So you have a method to test it. You have a data collection, what you're going to pull and information from the patients you treat um, and a control arm and a study arm. And then you'll have statistical analysis, which will say exactly, um, does this drug, is this drug better with sig uh, significance and how you're going to exactly mathematically prove that. And then you move on to conclusions. So what you can draw from um, the math, basically. Is this something that would be applicable in uh, the community with the disease or the community with something that needs to be prevented, like COVID-19? Human studies can be complicated, though, as you need 
uh, people to agree to participate and be informed. So they have to really understand what they're signing up for. So sample sizes can be difficult. Uh, you also have to have control groups, but it's not really ethical to have a control group without treatment and just say, hey, we're treating this one group and we're not treating the other. So a lot of times they'll uh, have the control group be the standard of care. And then the experimental group is the investigational drug or vaccine when they're just trying to prove equivalence. Um, or even if it surpasses that, maybe you can market that as something better than the standard of care. Uh, also, you have to deal with human error. So patients who stop therapy or who don't come back for the clinic to follow up. Uh, so really having people in your study uh, that represent the population, but who can also come to the clinic, receive their dose of medication and follow up with the, um, the study is really important. And also having objective measurements to subjective symptoms. So that can be like pain. Somebody's uh, pain scale of two can be equal to another's pain scale of five. So a lot of times you just try to find the change or uh, exactly what changes when you administer a medication. So you're kind of assigning a reliable um, scale to something that's more subjective, which a lot of times in science uh, isn't the best, but in human trials, that's kind of what you're, what you're left to do. Then after you have all the phase one through three clinical data, you apply for a new drug status, and this can be sent to the FDA. So all your information uh, from your phase trials and your clinical trials, and it contains the data and safety, data of safety and efficacy. And it also includes things that you're gonna send with the drugs like proposed labeling and directions for use. You take it twice a day, once a day, who was it approved for? Some of the safety updates, maybe you found a side effect in phase three that you didn't see in phase two any data from studies uh, collected outside of the US, and also um, IRB approval or institutional review board um, approval, basically saying that hospitals agreed to let you use their experimental drug. And it takes about 10 years from starting phase one to uh, successfully getting new drug status from the FDA. Uh, it can even be longer than that. I wanted to throw in Ogentis or um, Opicapone, which is a new a Parkinson medication that was just approved at the end of April. Uh, it was based on two phase three trials, the BIPARC-1 and BIPARC-2, which when combined had over a thousand patients who had Parkinson's disease. And it's designed to work in combination with a staple drug called levodopa of the disease to basically, when you give it in combination, you can lower the amount of levodopa given so it reduces side effects of levodopa and it increases efficacy because you don't have to um, be on these high doses of levodopa, you can be on smaller doses. And this was just approved, so it had to go through this entire process before it could come to the market. I wanted to include this because this is not only vaccine production, uh, but uh, medication development as well. So you need healthcare professionals, uh, manufacturers and in private industry who provide funding in hopes of getting a return when they market the drug, non-governmental uh, organizations, academia to study the drugs, governmental agencies to provide funding, media to promote uh, new drugs or to promote vaccines and really inform the public and individuals and communities who can seek out treatment or who know to get a vaccine when it's recommended by the CDC in order to protect themselves and their community. Phase four I wanted to include as well. This is after the drug gets approved as a new drug by the FDA um, and it's basically just any continuation study uh, looking at safety and efficacy. They closely resemble the phase three trials, but they may include more individuals. There are some exceptions to the rules. Uh, we have expanded access or compassionate use, and that's basically before the drug uh, gets the new drug um, status, patients can have access to it uh, before all the information is submitted to the FDA. This happens a lot with uh, oncology drugs or cancer drugs. You also have breakthrough fast track, accelerated approval, and priority review, which are all designations by the FDA that can kind of speed up the process. And this is done a lot with cancer medications as well, just to, if you see something that's doing really, really well, you can put it on a fast track so it gets approved within two to eight years instead of greater than 10 years. So coming back to COVID-19, there's a lot of unproven therapy options that didn't just go through this rigorous process that I've explained. Uh, one of them being hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, um, they're both medications that kind of suppress uh, the immune system and immune response. It can be used in rheumatoid arthritis or malaria. And um, the problem with uh, this whole, how this got started was there was a study done in the Middle East, or 
there were some doctors in the Middle East in which uh, reporters reported on uh, without really getting uh, their treatment and how they were using it. Um, and it wasn't this miracle therapy that was actually curing patients, and it wasn't studied at all. And so I know the president had said it, and, and it, you know, it was the talk of the town for a while, but really it is completely unproven in the fact that uh, it would treat um, COVID-19 or, or any viruses for that matter. Also, homeopathic remedies or supplements, uh, none of these have scientific evidence. The laws that we have in the United States permit them to kind of skirt this process as long as they don't say that they're medications. Uh, they can say that their supplements are homeopathic, which means that they don't make a claim on treating anything, um, but they say that they may help with something and they have no really scientific, no real scientific evidence supporting them. Also, drinking alcohol was uh, a proposed method of preventing COVID-19, but, and the logic might be sound at first because you think of hand sanitizer and how if you use hand sanitizer, it's a good disinfectant. But the problem is that even high proof um, alcohols normally only go up to 40%. And you need at least 70% alcohol for it to be um, able to clean. And you wouldn't consume that normally. And, and you guys are all under 21 anyway, so it's not like you guys really had to worry about that. But also don't drink uh, cleaning products. Uh, these have not gone through the phase trials, of course, and they would do much more harm than good. So what we can do until now, or for now, and that is uh, preventing the spread to yourself. So you can wash your hands using proper technique as often as possible and you can uh, wipe down your groceries with cleaning wipes, basically anything you touch or come in contact to uh, that might have been in contact with other people, clean it. And also, uh, which is even more important, is preventing the spread to others. You guys are all healthy, uh, but many people in your family might be a little older, might be immunocompromised, or might have asthma or COPD. And in this case, you might want to social distance from them especially. Uh, wash your hands using proper technique as often as possible. If you can't wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, which is over 70% alcohol. Uh, do not visit people who are at higher risk. Like I said, wear a mask when the CDC recommends it. Um, as we go from this red, red quarantine stage to more of a yellow, so like a cautionary, and as things start to open up, we're still going to have to be very careful to make sure that we don't uh, spike the, the case rates and, and increase deaths. And also, when a vaccine does come out, make sure you get vaccinated. Listen to the CDC guidelines. Vaccines are one of the most rigorous um, scientific conclusions that uh, the United States government and the scientific and the healthcare community come to because such a large population get them that they have to be studied extremely, extremely well. So most of the time, uh, I would say that vaccines are one of the most highly recommended things to get uh, according to your age and risk factors. I wanted to show this little anecdote. This was um, some data on the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Uh, this is uh, comparison of Philadelphia and St. Louis. Uh, this was a, a very similar type of novel virus, and Philadelphia chose to not cancel a World War I parade, uh, while St. Louis ended up banning gatherings over 20, very similar to our uh, social distancing measures. And you can see that the death rate spiked um, in Philadelphia because they didn't enact a social distancing policy. And uh, this is really a problem whenever the hospitals that we have really can't handle this many sick people. So you can even see St. Louis later down the line uh, tried to lift distancing measures and the death rate spiked. So they actually reinstated uh, the distancing measures around uh, the middle of December. And it's just something that you can kind of pull from history and learn from and, and make sure that we can not make the same mistakes again. Because you can see Philadelphia had much, much more deaths. So how to stay informed, keep up to date with the CDC and follow the population health experts, um, even some doctors. You can read anecdotes of some doctors. When hydroxychloroquine was mentioned, you could see a bunch of doctors ordering hydroxychloroquine for their family and themselves. Uh, everybody can succumb to fear, but you need to be rational in this time of great concern and make sure whoever you listen to are citing their sources. So don't be afraid to fact check anything you hear. Uh, from the media, um, even the CDC, fact check. Um, you can also get second opinions from the population health experts. So, so keep your ears tuned in to listen, but make sure that you can also um, verify exactly what they're saying. So any questions you guys have about the presentation, about pharmacy, about pursuing a healthcare career, or about starting college, college please feel free to email me at jkester0812 at gmail.com if you have 
any any questions, concerns, comments um, about this quarantine, about the processes of designing new medications and vaccines, um, and even how uh, Freedom is coping with the the virtual classroom and, and things like that, and exactly your your thoughts and opinions about it. I'd love to hear it, and, and we can discuss about it. Uh, so thank you guys. Here are my sources right here. Most of my stuff was pulled from the CDC, the FDA, um, and some news websites about drug releases. Uh, a great resource that you can use, especially to get a little bit more informed. There was a Netflix one episode docu documentary episode uh, regarding the history of coronaviruses and how this one particular relates to others and exactly how we're handling uh, the pandemic all over the world. So definitely check that out if you're interested. And like I said, email me with any other questions. So thank you for your time, and it was a pleasure getting to speak with you today.